Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about electricity as part of the RADS 201 course. And in this lecture, we're going to uh, talk about four different areas, uh, four different objectives. So we're going to define electrification, provide examples. We'll list the laws of electrostatics. We'll define what's meant by direct current versus alternating current. And then we'll identify the units of electric potential and electric power. So for electrostatics, electrostatics is basically the study of stationary electric charges, hence the term statics. And when we talk about electricity, electric charges are either positive or they're negative. Okay, if we look to the atom, for example, our positively charged protons are incorporated into the nucleus, and then we have our electrons, of course, being within the shells at certain distances uh, from the nucleus. So we have electrons and protons being the smallest units of electric charge. The protons are given a plus one charge and your electrons have a minus one charge. And that's going to be important because when we talk about and define what an atom is, for example, an atom is said to be electrically neutral. And the reason for this is because you have in an atom an exact and equal number of protons and electrons. So for example, if you had an atom of barium, for example, and you had 56 protons, if it's an atom of barium, then you would also have 56 electrons uh, because protons have a plus one charge, electrons have a minus one charge. You uh, sum up the positive charges, sum up the negative charges, uh, and when together, you basically get zero, so there's electric neutrality. We want to keep in mind that electrons are more freely movable than the protons within the atom. So therefore, nearly all discussions of electric charge deal with the electrons, the negative electric charges and their movement. Let's define electrification. So you say an object is said to be electrified if it has too few or too many electrons, okay? So if you've got too many electrons, okay, or too few electrons, we say that that object is electrified. And there's three means by which electrification can be created. You can create electrification by means of contact, friction, or induction. Okay, so contact, friction, induction. Those three things are, are important. When we talk about electrification, again, again, it's due to the movement of the negative electric charges. So we're talking about a movement of the electrons, not a movement of the protons. So positive electric charges do not move. A transfer of electrons from one object to another causes the first to be positively electrified and the second to be negatively electrified. So let's think about that. Let's say we've got two objects, okay, and one of those objects gives up some of its electrons, okay, which means now it's got more positive charges. So we say it's positively charged. And the object to which the electrons were given now have more negative charges, so we say that that object is negatively electrified. So there's one object that's always available to accept electric charges uh, from an electrified object, and that's the Earth itself. It behaves as a huge reservoir for stray electric charges, and electrically speaking, it's referred to then as electric ground. So here's a, a picture, a pretty, pretty cool picture. It's a, it's a dramatic example of movement of electrons seen during a thunderstorm. And of course, that movement of electrons is basically in the form of a lightning bolt. For electrostatic charge, the smallest unit of electric charge is the electron. Because the single charge is difficult to measure, 
a quantity of electrons. So hence the term, or notice the term quantity, a quantity of electrons termed a coulomb is the fundamental unit of electric charge. Okay, so it's very difficult scientifically, you know, to, to talk about and, and to deal with a single electric charge. So what we do is we take a group of them uh, together. We call them a coulomb. And if we look to the bottom of the slide here, the coulomb is the standard unit of electric charge in the international system of units. A quantity of one coulomb is equal to approximately 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons. That's, that's pretty amazing because that's 6.24 quintillion electron charges. So you can see a, a coulomb is a very, very large quantity of electrons. Let's talk about the electrostatic laws. So there's basically four laws that describe how electric charges will interact with each other and with neutral objects. So the first electrostatic law that's very important is that unlike charges attract and like charges repel. Our next unit is going to be on magnetism. It's very similar to uh, when we talk about unlike poles attract and like poles repel. Um, so if you've got a positive and a negative, uh, they're going to attract each other. If you got a positive and a positive, they'll repel. A negative and a negative, they'll repel. So unlike charges attract and like charges repel. One of the electrostatic laws has to do with what's called Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law states the electrostatic force is directly proportional to the product of the electric static charges, and it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now, when we look at that and we think about radiography, it's something we've already or close to something we've learned basically, uh, and, and that's the inverse square law, right? Okay, if you look at the wording of Coulomb's law and then you think about the wording of the inverse square law, they're very similar. Electrostatic law number three states that electric charge distribution is uniform throughout an object or on its surface. And the fourth law of electrostatic states that electric charge of a conductor is concentrated along the sharpest curvature of the surface. So we're going to talk about some, uh, some of these right now. So associated with each electric charge is an electric field. Okay. The electric field, and this is important to note, the electric field points outward from a positive charge into a negative charge. So take a look at the diagram there. Look at that positive charge and then notice the field lines, notice the arrowheads and which way they're going. They're going outward from the positive charge. Then on the right side, then you've got the negative charge. Once again, look at the field lines, but look at the arrowheads now. It's going in toward the negative charge. So this is why if you think about it, if you bring these two charges together, as it says there, unlike charges attract, while like charges then repel each other. Okay, so take a look at the two positive charges repelling, the two negative charges repelling, but then you got a positive and a negative, they are going to then attract. So using Coulomb's law, it can be determined that the electrostatic force is very strong when the objects are close, but it decreases rapidly as the objects separate. Once again, this is very, very similar to the inverse square law when we say when we talk about intensity and distance as the uh, the tube um, and the detector are closer and closer and closer the intensity goes up dramatically and then as we pull the tube further away from the detector the intensity drops off very dramatically okay, so very very similar as I mentioned Coulomb's law and the inverse square law Electric charge distribution is uniform throughout an object. So once again, here we can take a look at a cloud, for example, and, and how the electrons within the cloud uh, basically uh, can be set up so that you can uh, actually create a bolt of lightning. So when a diffuse non-conductor becomes electrified, 
uh, such as the thundercloud, the electric charges are distributed rather uniformly throughout the cloud. Uh, with electrified copper, that's another example, a copper wire, the excess electrons are distributed on the outer surface of the wire. So you can either have it diffuse through the object like in a cloud or on the exterior as in a piece of copper wire. The next one, electric charge of a conductor is concentrated along the sharpest curvature of the surface. So a good example of this, uh, albeit not the, maybe the, the nicest example, is a cattle prod. Okay, so cattle prods are, are they're similar to stun guns in design. Uh, they apply an electric current across two electrodes, but they serve a completely different function. So a stun gun, as it says here, uses an electric charge to incapacitate someone while a cattle prod applies a charge to get a, a person, hopefully not a person, but an animal moving like cattle. Uh, cattle prod only causes pain. It does not significantly affect the muscles and nervous system of the body. Uh, these two devices differ mainly in their voltage. The voltage in a stun gun is high enough to send electricity throughout the entire body. Uh, the lower voltage in a cattle prod only shocks at the point of contact. So cattle prods basically uh, are meant to, to move cattle. Okay. Um, maybe the city folk don't realize that, um, you know, or how they're used. Uh, certainly if you're, you know, living on a farm, you know, this is probably a, a common tool that you would use to get your cattle moving. Let's talk about electric potential. So electric charges have potential energy. Electric charges gathered at one end of a wire create an electric potential because of the electrostatic repulsive force will cause some electrons to move along the wire and work can be done. So when you've got all these negative charges, they're gonna eventually wanna repel each other and they're gonna move along a wire. Now this unit or the unit that we use for electric potential is the volt, okay? So whenever you hear electric potential you should think of voltage. Another term that's sometimes used to describe electric potential is EMF. So electric potential sometimes is referred to as EMF, electromotive force. And think about the term motive means in motion, right? So a uh, movement of elect uh, electrons, or as it says here more often, just simply as voltage. Uh, very important. So in the United States, the electric potential is 110 volts. Okay, uh, so when you plug something into your uh, plug, you're, you're talking about 110 volts that are going to be moving a certain quantity of electrons. Your larger appliances in your home, they may require 220 volts. So even the plug sometimes looks different. Um, and basically, how do you get 220 volts? Well, the electrician would have to combine two 110 uh, lines to get you a 220 line, a special line used for your larger appliances in your home, like your refrigerator, uh, washer, dryer, uh, those, those larger appliances. Let's move on to electrodynamics now. So dynamics, dyno, dyno means movement or dynamic. So if voltage is applied to a copper wire, then the electrons will move along the wire. Okay. This is called an electric current or simply electricity. Okay. So I'd like you to take a look at the drawing there. There's a, a very simple schematic of a circuit. Okay, so you've got a source of EMF, okay, a source of electrons, potential uh, energy there, battery. Okay, that's the symbol for a battery. Okay. You've got some type of a resistor there, which in this case, it would be a light bulb. Um, you don't want the current flowing all the time, so you have a switch, okay? But what I want you to notice in this drawing here is you've got an arrow indicating that of the current is flowing in one direction, but the electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. This is very confusing, okay? Um, I'll be the first to admit it. So we want to keep in mind the direction of electric current is important. Electrons move from the areas of highest concentration to the lowest. 
As it says, there's much confusion regarding electron flow versus current flow because the early pioneers in electricity, uh, for example, Ben Franklin, uh, assumed that the moving charges were positive versus negative. Now, remember, what did we just learn? It's not the positive charges that move, it's the negative ones. So because of that, then the unfortunate result of the confusion is that and this is very, very important. The direction of electric current is always opposite to electron flow. So if the current is flowing in one direction in a circuit, the electrons are flowing in the opposite. Confusing, all right? But just always uh, keep that point in mind. Electrical engineers speak of electric current while physicists are concerned with electron flow. So, as mentioned, electrodynamics is the study of electric charges in motion. And we've got uh, different categories. We've got something called conductors, which a conductor is any substance through which, which electrons flow easily. So good examples of conductors are water and most of your metals, copper being the best. Insulators are any material that does not allow or impedes electron flow. Uh, for example, you've got uh, rubber, you've got glass, you've got clay, and uh, any other earth-like uh, material. And then we've got semiconductors, a material that under some circumstances allows electrons to flow, and in other circumstances allows, uh, or I should say stops the flow. And examples of this would be silicon and germanium. So look at the drawing, or the uh, picture there uh, of a wire that's been cut apart. You've got the copper wire, which would be the conductor, and then surrounding it then, you've got uh, rubber casing, which would be the insulator. Semiconductors are best talked about when we talk about computers, okay? And notice what a semiconductor does again. It allows electrons to flow, or it doesn't allow them to flow. And that's really basically the way that a uh, a computer operates, right? It, through a circuit, it's going to allow the voltage to flow or not to flow. If you remember back to uh, somewhere along the line, you probably learned about computers, and you learned that computers really only operate on ones and zeros. Either there's a flow of electron electricity through a part of the circuit, or there's not a flow of electricity through a circuit part of the circuit. So once again, keep in mind, conductors allow electrons to flow easily. Insulators don't allow electrons to flow. And then we've got the middleman, which would be the semiconductors, which in some instances allows electrons to flow, and in others, it does not. So an important fact is that at room temperature, all materials resist the flow of electricity. So you can, you can decrease that amount of resistance by decreasing the temperature of the material. So the colder that you get, the least resistance to electron flow that you have. There's a property that's called superconductivity. And this property states that uh, some materials exhibit no resistance uh, below a very cold critical temperature. And there's two basic types of materials that are, are, are superconducting materials. And these would be niobium and titanium. So important point again, the colder that we can make it, the less resistance uh, that there is.